Hello, and welcome to what is now our second in the series of Tipping the Pain Scale. Uh, we are going all around the state in North Carolina, um, so we're on two of seven. Um, I want to thank you for joining us. Hopefully everyone got to watch the film um, up, until, up, up, up until we started the panel so that we have some context for the conversation. Um, I want to take a minute before we get started to thank our partners along the way for putting this whole series together and then helping us do this one in Fayetteville today. Um, <clears throat> we partnered with the UNC System Office with the North Carolina Independent Colleges and Universities to host the series, as well as the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition uh, for this event here. Today, we uh, partnered with Fayetteville State University, Methodist University, and the Carolina Treatment Center. So lots of folks really engaged with this conversation. I think our timing is impeccable and really important. We're thrilled we have about 175 people on with us today um, at this event alone. And so we're reaching a lot of folks, hearing a lot of great feedback. Before we get into introducing um, our panelists and get us uh, kicked off in the conversation, um, I wanna take a minute to thank our host site. We're, we're actually at Carolina Treatment Center today. So I wanna um, thank them for their graciousness with hosting us. Uh, we, yes, you'll notice some um, yeah, coffee cups. We've gotten lots of, lots of free coffee, uh, great tech here. We have ring lights here. So um, we, we all should look really, really fancy for you. Um, I wanna introduce you to Lewis who can tell you a little bit about Carolina Treatment Centers. If, you, if you're not familiar with them yet, um, you should be. So Lewis. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Lewis. I am the clinic director here at Carolina Treatment Center. Uh, we are the largest opioid treatment program here in North Carolina. We serve individuals who are diagnosed with opioid use disorders, and we utilize a comprehensive treatment approach while doing it. Uh, this means that we use medication and counseling for more successful outcomes. Uh, I want to thank the APNC, one, for allowing us the opportunity to, to host this event. Um, and I want to thank the panelists that are here because many of them are individuals uh, that we also work with in our community um, for the individuals that we serve. And so, once again, thank you guys for being here and welcome. Thank you, Lewis. Hey. Thank you. Lewis, uh, before we got started today, Lewis was just fantastic getting us all set up, making sure we were comfortable, had everything we needed. So, thank you to Carolina Treatment Centers and to Lewis. Um, before we go any further, most of you saw Joseph Green in the film. Um, hopefully everyone saw the film and saw Joseph Green. Um, I would like to ask Joseph to kick us off um, doing some, you sharing some, uh, can I show, call it a poem? You can call it a poem. He's going to share a poem. <laughs> you, you never know what it's going to be with Joseph. So um, he's going to share a poem with us to kick us off. Um, building on what we saw in the movie um, from Joseph, and then we'll introduce him a little more formally. Yeah, um, I was going to do an interpretive dance, but now I guess I have to do a poem. Um, I don't like being pigeonholed. Hi, everybody. My name is Joseph Green, and if you've seen the movie, uh, thank you. And if you haven't seen the movie, please do. Uh, and in the movie, I, I do some poems, and I'm not going to do the poems from the movie. I'm going to do a different poem. Uh, but I was having a conversation with my new best friend today, and we were just talking about how a lot of what we go through is passed generationally and how part of our healing was being able to forgive and understand that those people before us did the best that they could with the knowledge that they had. And so the poem I wanted to do, and it made me think of my father and uh, the poem I have about my father. So that's what I would like to start with today. Um, and it's just dedicated to anybody who plays that role for anybody. Um, it's called Life is Short. In the hospital bed, I helped him turn so the cancer medication could spread more evenly. His eyes welled, then cracked like a fortune cookie. The piece of paper inside read, life, is short, but being alive is the longest thing you will ever do. Proceed accordingly. 
If I'd attempted this homage to my father 20 years ago, it probably would have consisted more of the intangibles that drove me away, hate and blame more than just mere symptoms of childhood angst, but the language I learned to speak an effort to explain how my father's absence from my formative years made me feel. You see, I once considered my father's DNA to be a cancer in me, understanding the helix to be doubled. I never dreamed of losing myself completely, only half. A man now, I realized my thinking was the cancer. Forgiveness is medication. I'm still waiting for it to spread evenly. Always with the wrong bottle in hand from birth, my father showed me the image of addict. It resembled something like a court jester juggling knives, one blade for family, one blade for work, one for the military that never treated him as equal, one for the father that died when he was 10, another for the mother that was never the same, all the while spiraling down towards the greatest come to Jesus moment ever. 16-year-old son in the back seat, his wife picks him up from jail after his second DUI. My father has been in recovery for over 30 years. My father's poison was alcohol. Mine was cocaine. They say parents want children to grow up, achieve feats greater than their own. I don't believe this is what they had in mind. I've spent years mortified of mirrors for having his image reflected back on me. I saw the new likeness at the bottom of empty whiskey bottles and clear plastic baggies. I mainlined hate and blame until I became so high. I had nowhere to go, rock bottom in the sky. I landed in my father's arms. Through falling, I've come to realize that just as he did not, I did not ask for this predilection towards addiction, that hate and blame are just new ways to get high for those of us not willing to change. And that which took him over half a lifetime only took me 10 years because he has shown me what redemption looks like, what a life lived in recovery looks like. I refuse to be 20 years down the line, racing down Route 95, a bat out of a homemade hell, stopped by a cop for going 95, exclaiming out of the window of my car that like all men, my father is dying. And like most men, I never told him I understood. Never told him I realized one of those blades he juggled had love for family inscribed in it. Never said, I forgive you, pops, as I hope you have forgiven me. And though I realize neither side of this reflection will ever be perfect, I am no longer scared of mirrors because life is short, but being alive is the longest thing you will ever do. Proceed accordingly. Thank you. Welcome, Todd Loudon. That is awkward. I know that he's staring at the camera the whole time doing this very emotional poem. Yes, thank you. I appreciate it. I know we're <laughs> no, I, I think that is it's very apropos of the complexities of addiction, the generational issues, what we carry with us in every single day. Um at I'm Sarah Potter at APNC. Um, we see that complexity from lots of different angles. We see it with the people that we work with on the ground that need help. We see it with the college students that we're working with in collegiate recovery. We see it with the clinicians and the service workers and the care workers in our frontline workforce. We see it in their families as well. And we see it with policymakers. It, it, this really does touch us all um, in very different ways. And so thank you, thank you for that. Um, it's easy to read those words on paper. It's different to live that. And um, so I, I'm grateful for us all being here today and for all that we, we bring to the table. It's because of the complexities of where we have been as a country with addiction, where we are at now, um, <clears throat> at this moment in time, that APNC decided to do this series. This is not a normal event for us. It's a different way of doing things, but we thought it was really important. COVID has been really impactful on our field, on people working in the field. Um, these are our frontline workers. They come to this work with their own histories and stories and generational things. We all bring that to the table. They are just like other frontline workers, stressed out and overloaded to the max. Um, our system has been taxed and challenged in ways that it has never been before, as have we 
as families, as parents, as people. Um, and so we thought this was a really important time to have these conversations because we have together as a country not been at this moment in time before. It has never been so clear, painfully clear that mental health and diseases of despair and <clears throat> addiction are front and center. And we have never felt it in the way that we are now. And so we wanted to do this, this panel today. Um, harm reduction finally is getting the acceptance or starting to get the acceptance and traction in this country that has needed for a really long time. So we're happy to partner with Harm Reduction on this as well. So we're uh, finally, uh, we're getting there on that, finally. Um, our legislators and policymakers have been in North Carolina hands-on with the COVID stuff and figuring out what are we going to do. And they have, they want to hear from us. So they want to hear from their communities. They've been behind closed doors, dealing with budgets and laws and emergency procedures and really dealing with the crisis of the day. They want to hear from us what, what is needed, what is important, what is going to rise up. And so APNC having that link between service and families and people um, to make those policy connections for them and help them be with us and share that is, is really critical for us right now too. It's clear, I think, for, for us working in this field, but for anyone who has experienced um, mental health or addiction in their families or amongst their friends, it is clear that as a country, we have not figured this out. It has not been working. Um, there's been no silver bullet. What we, just, what we see now is things amping up harder and harder and harder. So now is the time for us to decide how we're gonna address this, how we think about it, how we talk about it and where we're going forward. And so that's what we're here, all here to do today. Those of you on, on screen with us, please do send in your questions. I promise you, if we don't get to all the questions today, we will circle back and make sure that we post those in an FAQ document at the end of the series. If you haven't had a moment to fill out, there's a survey. So I mentioned our leaders in the state and our policymakers in the state, um, please fill out that survey. So we are not sitting here just for the sake of conversation. For those of you who know APNC and know me, uh, that's not really my MO. And so the whole reason for being here is so that we can drive change forward in North Carolina on your behalf. So please fill out that survey. I promise you that is not gonna go into a file somewhere on anyone's desk. Um, we are going to use that to raise up what is the most important things that our leaders need to focus on. So please fill that out. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go around the table and let everyone introduce them themselves a little bit now. You did see everyone's bio um, in, in the intermission, but we'll go ahead, go around the table and introduce ourselves. So uh, Ricky Ballard, can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, um, I'm Ricky Ballard. I am with Federal State University. I am one of the licensed counselor in the Counseling and Personal Development Center. Um, we were happy when APNC kind of um, let us know about this project and you know, Methodist University, our um, sister, um, sister college here in Fayetteville, um, we work together in the community in these substance use programs. And when we heard about this, we just were like, yes, this is an opportunity for our students that we really want to share with them. So Federal State University, we are happy to be a part of this with APNC today. Thank you, welcome. Joseph Green, can you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Joseph Green. Um, if you've already read my bio, I'll tell you something about me that's not in there. Um, I was born in Washington, D.C., and every member of my immediate family is military. Um, and so it's uh, kind of special to be down here near Fort Bragg um, and talking about issues as it pertains to the veteran community has, has been something that I've been very passionate about as my father and mother and brother were all in service. So that's something new, you know. Welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Melissa Larson, to the left. 
Um, Melissa Larson, I work with North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition. My role there is to support law enforcement agencies and communities that are interested in developing um, harm reduction strategies for their community. And I'm super excited to be here in Fayetteville. I've been supporting this community for a while through the C14, which is Cumberland Fayetteville Opioid Response Team. Uh, for a couple of years now, we've been getting together diverse stakeholders to really talk about what the community needs and how we can develop strategies uh, using a collective impact model. And um, Greg Berry. Uh, it's Gregory Berry. Um, I am a North Carolina peer support specialist and a outreach worker with North Carolina Arm Reduction um, here in Fayetteville and Cumberland County. Um, I'm also a formerly incarcerated person just in long-term recovery. So I use my expertise and training, you know, as peer support and arm reduction along with my, my lived experience um, to make an impact in the community. Thank you. <clears throat> Mitzi Averett. My name is Mitzi Averett, and I am a nurse. I've been a nurse for 45 years. And the good news is I've been in recovery for a pretty good percentage of that amount of time. And I currently teach nursing at Methodist University. And my volunteer role in that university is um, when I learned about the existence of collegiate recovery, it was very interesting to me that I didn't know about it before I knew about it. Joseph and I had this conversation earlier today. It's like, you don't know what you don't know. And then sometimes you get an awareness. And I, um, I learned about collegiate recovery and became very excited to try to bring it to Fayetteville. Because at that time, our three, I had worked at Fayetteville Tech. I knew people in, in all locations, all three locations. And we didn't have anything in Fayetteville as far as peer-led student supporting each other in a collegiate recovery setting. So um, I, it took some time. Um, many of us at this table are, um, have been members of a, of a coalition for quite some time. And they would say, Mitzi's talking about collegiate recovery again. <laughs> <laughs> and I never shut up. And I kept going. And luckily, we have a, an amazing administration at our college now that um, supported me. It's my volunteer work. And the collegiate recovery that I host, the gathering that I host, is open to the entire community. I worked at Fayetteville Tech for 15 years. And I have students who are at Fayetteville Tech who are also part of, you know, connected to the collegiate recovery. And I'm just very grateful. ABNC and many people at this table and that are part of the coalition here have really supported once this got going. And I'm very grateful for um, being able to bring students, any age college student together to support each other on this path. It's, college is an abstinent, hostile place. Mm -hmm. And I'm Sarah Potter, the Executive Director and Addiction Professionals from North Carolina. Um, happily here for a few years, um, came by way of the Midwest. So I'm a farm girl originally, um, Illinois and then California, worked on these systems on the border in California, learned a whole lot there back by way of Illinois, and then now I'm on this coast and, and happily here. Um, I've been here for about 10 years, and um, I think I'm in the right place at the right time, and I think APNC is, uh, is, has a, a unique vantage point um, from a lot of associations that we see covering prevention, treatment, recovery, harm reduction all across the state from organizations to individuals all along that service array. So happy to be here and um, honored to have all of you around the table with me. And then I'm going to introduce Sarah, or you're going to introduce Sarah Howe, the other Sarah. <laughs> yes, I'm the other Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Howe. Um, I have the great honor of working with a healthcare advisory firm called Third Horizon Strategies. And we have been very blessed to work with people like Joseph in producing the Tipping the Pain Scale film. So it's been an exciting endeavor. Um, I do not claim any 
creativity whatsoever on the film. Um, that is our wonderful partner, Greg Williams, who's the producer, and our CEO, David Smith, who's the associate producer. But I come by this field um, from 20 years, also in Illinois, like Sarah Potter. Um, I worked at the State Association in Illinois as an advocate and also on the board of directors for, um, gosh, eight years for the National Council for Mental Well-Being. I'm a child of an alcoholic. Um, I'm also a child of an army veteran. And I have a sibling with a severe mental illness. So um, this work is not a paycheck. It, I, it, I come by it very, very honestly because it's important to me. And it's my great honor to work with APNC and to be here today with all of you as we continue to move this forward. Thank you. Okay, so let's let's uh, start our, our friendly conversation about um, by just giving some reactions to the film. What stood out to you? Uh, how did you feel? What's going to stick with you later? What were your initial reactions to the film? Well, for me, um, right away, you know, I identify with what Roz is doing, of course, because she's doing harm reduction out there. So. Um, you know, that caught my attention immediately, seeing the work that she was doing and what she was up against. Um, I'm fortunate here. I mean, I don't know everything that's going on with her, but I'm fortunate here to be part of a, an organization that has got a lot of experience and a lot of support. And so I have a lot of um, wonderful people to help me, you know, with, with my outreach. It looked like she was um, doing a lot of that on her own and with um, limited resources. Um, so that was one of the things that, that stood out to me first is, is seeing what outreach looks like in Philly mm -hmm. and seeing what she was doing and then something else that resonated with me kind of um, circling back to what Sarah just said a second ago about like um, she's not just in this field for a paycheck you know like myself I can be making a living doing a, a ton of other things but um what I see a lot of people that are in this field because of personal connection and passion. Mm -hmm. And um, that separates, I think, the people that are most effective in, in this line of work, mm -hmm. you know, from everyone else. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I was immediately struck within like the first couple minutes. I was carrying my laptop around the house, like making dinner and whatnot. And I kept pausing and rewinding because everything that everybody said was just so like, powerful even starting in the beginning they talked about it. it's not an opioid epidemic it's an addiction epidemic and then they started really breaking it down between physical pain and emotional pain and how we keep focusing on the physical pain but we're not putting as much towards the emotional pain and mm -hmm. i thought that was just so powerful to really break it down like that and I could talk all day about how much I love that movie. I'm mean, gonna yeah. be honest with you. Like, there's just so many diverse stories, and like you said, all the geography that was involved, and seeing the different challenges uh, throughout communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think it's very true what you said about the emotional pain. When I watched it, and as a counselor, when when my clients come in, that's the first thing I talk about is how our past experience very much influenced the people that we are today. Mm -hmm. And that's where I start with my clients. Mm -hmm. You know, building that connection, watching those patterns in their life, helping them connect the dots. Sometimes they don't understand. Some come in and they automatically know and some mm -hmm. don't. And knowing that emotional pain, like you said, like in the film where it's talking about the emotional pain and talking about... Um, the physical pain. Mm -hmm. I mean, in counseling a few years ago, they talk about trauma-informed care where they mm -hmm. were teaching doctors instead of treating symptoms, start asking your patients, where's the stomachache coming from? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it's coming from the stress that I'm watching my family go through domestic violence. Yes. Stop mm -hmm. treating the symptoms, start treating the problem, which mm -hmm. is getting the family the help that they need to address the problem. Yeah. So when we're talking about that emotional pain, figuring out how do we treat that mm -hmm. rather than you know, treating with medication management for something that is never going to cure that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it really did connect with me because I'm like, oh gosh, that's exactly every day what I'm talking. And why am I continuing to have these conversations with every client every single time, yeah. every single day? Yeah. And then when he talked about building resilience in our communities, mm -hmm. that begins in our schools. Right. That begins in teaching our children how mm -hmm. to be resilient. Mm -hmm. You know, I came from a public school setting prior to coming to work at the university and that was one of the things I was working with the school setting on was that we need to be putting 
therapeutic methods into the school system. We need to be teaching our children how to be resilient, just as much as we need to be teaching them about math and reading and writing. Because if they can't be resilient, then how are they going to be successful in life? Yeah, absolutely. She, she, she's taking my bed. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I say. No, I, thank you for that. I, I love hearing that coming out of more and more people. Um, I think the thing for being in the film, the thing that jumped out, I remember when I saw the first uh, trailer, because, you know, we shoot these things in a bubble. I have no idea who else is in the film. I have no idea who they're covering or what other stories. And so the first time I saw it, two things struck me. One, I was actually... The diversity of this film reflects the diversity of our country and the people who are being affected, not wholly, because obviously there are certain stories that didn't get in there, but it, more so than any other film that I had seen about it. And that was my fear that I was going to be the one person of color or any diversity in a film that covered up. And so when I saw that, I thought that was a super important thing because more people need to see themselves in this work to want to be or feel like they belong in this space, which I did not feel like I belonged when I first got into recovery work because I was told that race and things of that identity points were not important here. We're just saving lives. And to go to your point and to go to the point of the emotional pain, people's emotional pain are caused by so many different things. And part of my emotional pain being a black person in America was partially racial. So I, I saw that and I said, I felt like I was in really good hands there. Um, and then, then the second part was like, look at these people in this movie. Why am I in this movie with these people? When I saw Roz's clip, um, and then when we saw the whole movie in Vegas and I'm on the stage with all of them, you know, this is not me like, playing humble. I understand the value of the work that I do, but there are some real superstars as, as far as the human service work that we all do that are in this film and they just inspired the hell out of me so they just to be in that company was awesome right yeah. yeah i think the first thing i thought about was the public policy aspect having been in public policy for a long time passing a parity bill in, in 2008 i believe it was i mean a long time and you go out to washington and we're still saying <laughs> we're going to treat that differently. We're going to send you out. But what I loved about it was not that the story ended there. We saw how you can make change happen. And even then that wasn't enough. Now she's a legislator. She's continuing to move that forward. And when you ask that question and, and talking about what is it that struck you, but what do we do with this? I thought you see a lot of documentaries that leave you with, holy cow, what do I do? I'm not sure how to do it. Everybody's story in that film, yours included, said, no, we can do something different. We can change it. This showed what is the specific problem that somebody was trying to address and what did they do to fix it? And this can happen around the country. So I, I thought that was really, that struck me. Yeah, it's a great that's observation. Yeah. Your story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Second, what you said, this, that same thing stood out to me, that actionable step in the policy arena, the showing that it's all of us. The, the other part that I really liked about it is I think, I think in this, the way that we have always looked at addiction for sure is it's this crisis to that crisis to that crisis. What I really liked was that it took it out of that crisis mentality and said, it's all of us and it's not the crisis of the day. It is how do we deal with people? How do we like look at humans and how are we looking at this overall, which is different than we than we have done it in lots of ways, right? Like there's this pair and then there's this place and then there's this place and then there's substance use and then there's mental health and then which bucket are you a student or you not? And it just, it gets into all these tinkering of details that take us away as professionals and humans, take us away from picking our head up and going, oh yeah, I've been working on this 
thing for so long, I forgot this is about people. And it's not about this one person, it's about all of us now. And so, um, so I really love that part of the movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what stood out to me was number one, I love that Roz called everybody sunshine. Y'all seem like Because, you know, uh, I, I do I have experienced the, this, the understanding and the, the situation of how some people really struggle with thinking of this as a good versus bad or right versus wrong kind of an issue, um, as opposed to a, a human being who is sunshine. They exist and they are alive and, and they deserve to, for us to try to help with anything they need. Similar to that, I really enjoyed, and I don't remember the police officer's name. Joshua. Joshua. Josh, yeah. I loved that cutting hair. Everybody, except my son, gets their hair cut. <laughs> <laughs> and um, no, he does. <laughs> Infrequently. But how that, just that, it's in his police uniform, put an apron up on top of it and was cutting hair and how much that drew people, you know, into having conversations. We need to, each of us understand it is not, even though people have incredible skills such as storytelling and that's, and how Ricky's law got passed was through storytelling. That's exactly how it got passed. And so I'm so glad that, that, Joseph is helping us, you know, hear examples of how to tell stories better. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then it's also, so what, what is it that you do? Do you cut hair? Do you, what is it that you could just be who you are in a space and connect with people? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was also impressed by the um, street outreach officer for Boston Police. Um, just the way that he was out in the community, interacting with people, mm -hmm. trying to just, you know, dis, um, dispel their beliefs that they may have had about interactions with law enforcement and trying to like help people overcome barriers that might be in the way of them making some sort of change. And um, um, I thought that there, the police department there is, you know, embracing the, like the community policing model that they, and that really showed in the work that he was doing. And um, I thought that was pretty amazing. Yeah. Piggyback off of that real quick. I, I, coming from DC, um, and coming from a, a, a very strong like social justice background, I find like the story, Josh's story in particular, um, and I got to also sit on stage with him when we did this in Richmond, so I got to talk to him a little more. Uh, when people talk about the defund the police movement, um, I think about Josh, and I think that if you had his story with the people who were in that movement and then the people who hear that term and automatically shut off because they think that we're talking about living in a lawless state what we're talking about is taking the energy that is used almost solely in a punitive way and taking some of that energy money is energy and focusing it on a more compassionate way of meeting people where they are and how many of the unfortunate interactions that happen between communities and police officers would be changed if they approached people the way Josh approaches people. Um, and, you know, there was a certain amount of officers that were, you know, we're going to, if the percentages, because in, even in Boston, it's like 2% of Josh's and 98% of what we normally understand to be police officers. And so that percentage were 60 40, still working for a police force with a different mantra and a different like uh, mission rather uh, I think a lot of what we saw with Josh mm -hmm. would, would 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 permeate in, in, in a positive way and that would begin changing the negative stigma in that space mm -hmm. and then when we needed help we would call them because we felt like we would be actually being ushered towards medical attention or mental health work as opposed to being arrested mm -hmm. so not just that two points not just that one is um if you look at the impact that he alone was having yeah right we talk about that being increased exponentially by the you know what I mean? yeah. just look at the impact he had by himself yeah. that's significant in himself mm -hmm. but also the way that he when he was interacting with people like he was like 
asking them, hey, do you have warrants? Do you have charges? You, you know, let, let, me, <laughs> said, let, me, help help you, let yeah. me help you get, get. Yeah. you see a lot of times people that, you know, are in, uh, experiencing addiction, they get caught up in a lot of, you know, uh, petty crime and other things. And then it's like a snowball effect and it starts creating this hole that seems impossible for a person to get out of. You know, and sometimes it could be as simple as something happened to their driver's license and now they can't get their license back. Now they're driving with a suspended license. Now they're getting pulled over and then it's just all these things rack up on them and they really want to make a change or try to do something different. But when they look at, you know, all of these things, it looks impossible and there's not a helping hand that's coming across and saying, hey, in the I, hole with I, I you. see these barriers right here. Yeah. Let, let's work on resolving some of them and, and get you out of there so that you don't sit there in, in hopelessness. I would love to get my tax money to more of that. So <laughs> I, this actually, as I'm listening to us talk, um, leads me exactly where I where I wanted to go with this next conversation. I think the value of doing these things locally and for APNC to be able to share that widely across the state is that we can learn what's good in our areas. There are some really great, there's some really great things happening in this area. Asheville might not know about it mm -hmm. unless, unless you know. And so as we're talking about some of these things, I'd like to hear a little bit more from you all that live and work here every single day. What's good? Of course, when we were talking, you know, Melissa, I'm like, I know you're gonna say what is working well. I mean, even even with the lead program, yeah. not everyone, yeah. not everyone in the state has access to those programs. Mm -hmm. Those diversion programs are easier for some to the, to set up. Maybe folks don't even know about them. So I think sharing the things that are good mm -hmm. about what we're doing in this area is one of the things I really want to get out there today. So if you could. We can segue into <laughs> Melissa. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that. Please. You know, Fayetteville has been so responsive to harm reduction in many, many ways. Mm -hmm. And back, I think it was 2015, 16, North Carolina harm reduction actually started having conversations with the chief at Fayetteville Police Department and really starting to talk about what harm reduction is and how can we support the law enforcement initiatives and introducing harm reduction strategies. And it doesn't mean that cops have to necessarily engage in them, but they have to support them when available. Mm -hmm. And so that started officers carrying naloxone mm -hmm. um, in Fayetteville. And yeah. so that was like the first stepping stone. And then it becomes, well, let's have a conversation about overdose follow-ups. And, mm -hmm. and uh, Greg and his colleague, Tarleton, they're taking those calls from the police department and those mm -hmm. referrals for services. And then we start having a conversation about, well, are you aware, your officers aware that syringe exchange exists in this community? Right. And this is how you can support it. And this is why it's um, evidence-based. And then of course we have pre-arrest diversion. And when I was watching the Boston, I believe Boston, and there was a Baltimore or Boston, also has law enforcement assisted diversion. And it's just a really good way for community and law enforcement to come together. And so that's what we have here in Fayetteville. We've had the first uh, um, uh, law enforcement assisted diversion program was actually the fourth in the nation. And it's really a time for community stakeholders like community um, or Carolina Treatment Center, our local MCO mm -hmm. to come to the table, our law enforcement, our ADA, our harm mm -hmm. reduction, and our case managers at, at Coastal Horizons to say, how is so-and-so doing? Is there any barriers that we can help with? Okay, next person. And, you know, really going through and giving a really dedicated um, case staffing to how to help people navigate their journey, whatever their journey looks like. So um, I, I think the answer to the question there, like law enforcement in Cumberland County has been really supportive about harm reduction. And uh, it really helps people reduce the barriers of interactions with law enforcement. And it really helps get them connected to services because I'm always going to be understanding that law enforcement already has a lot on their plate, yeah. but it's staff like harm reduction and mm -hmm. Carolina treatment that that's their skill set, right? Yeah. Cops don't have to do everything. They're not, it's not their skill set, right. but there's so many people who are ready, willing, and able to say, yes, mm -hmm. let me have that participant and help mm -hmm. them navigate their challenges. Yeah. And I just took a colleague from Methodist on a tour of Columbia. Cumberland Recovery Resource mm -hmm. Center. And as she was giving the tour, she talked about how we do metrics about how quickly we can receive from a police officer mm -hmm. so that we can do our part and they can go on to get back to their part. 
yeah. because we want to encourage our collaboration between the two of us. And so for someone who has been here a long time and had experience with our previous detox location, mm -hmm. there were, I think, a little bit more paperwork and a few more barrier type things. And I was one person in the community that was so excited when I heard the medical director of Recovery International that they were going to be taking over out that detox location mm -hmm. and with their specific goals about working very directly with law enforcement, harm reduction, everyone to um, be able to more facilitate and remove barriers because the barriers are really what, there's often a small window of opportunity. Um, may I say something? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I, I last time you, you went into a question as I was saying, I was like, no, I just wanted to make sure I, wanted to share I wasn't um, prolonging this question. Um, but so in DC, I have a, I've had a wonderful opportunity for the last three years, two years, um, to work with cadets who are going to become officers um, in doing uh, social emotional learning, storytelling, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of it. Like I didn't know what my goal was when I went in. I was I was I was brought in as a teaching artist to another organization that I really got in. I was actually very very hesitant to do it, knowing my my crowd and, and being like, "Yo, now nah, I'm going. I'm helping out the police." Um, but the folks who are in this particular program are young people from DC who are getting uh, their education paid for at UDC as they are then going to become police officers afterwards. So it's a cadet program mm -hmm. and it's people in the community who are becoming police officers. Mm -hmm. And the questions that I asked them about why they were here or what they wanted to do, when the people are from the community, no one answers, I want to put people in jail, mm -hmm. right? Like that's not why I'm becoming a police officer because I want to arrest people. Um, and, and when you think about it as a one of the many forces that can be used to help heal a community. Mm -hmm. um, and then diversion programs and things of that sort seem more logical because it's a conversation that's coming from a place of compassion. Um, and the compassion is there because I'm a member of this community. I see the other members of this community as human beings also, as opposed to you know criminals, you know, and, and while there may be laws involved at the end of the day, even if there has to be time served or whatever it is, we're still trying to get people back home to their families. We're still trying to make sure that people are okay. And so I just, all of this is wonderful. And I love the coming from like the positive standpoint. And one of the things that you can also do positively is make sure that the training that the officers are getting is greater than just how to respond to crime in that way, yeah. right? In the way that it's traditional mm -hmm. and in bringing more of that, you know, because I think, I would love to believe that every person who becomes a police officer does it because they want to make the world a better place. Yeah. So how can we help them do that more effectively? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's such a hard, uh, a hard thing to tackle because the law says that substance use disorder, using drugs, is illegal, right? Yeah. And that's what they and, and officers signed up to to protect the the state and the constitution and those laws. And but at the same time, you're asking them to use their discretion to completely change the way that they handle a call. And so that training and them coming from a more compassionate place and understanding that we can't be everything to everybody, that there's yeah. other stakeholders ready, um, is something that we have to continue to talk to them about. And you think about a police force could have someone who, who is nearing retirement that really bought into the war on drugs. And you can have right beside him or her an officer who just came out of training where they have that more social work um, background and training and mm -hmm. you know community is still reflective of those two yeah. those two cultures so i see better things for sure as we yeah. and, 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 and this is the complexity of it right yeah. there's no like everyone's going to take storytelling workshops and we fixed it you know it's, right. it's, it's not that it's about the stories that come up from that space and then what we do with them and then getting the older cop and the younger cop together and letting that generational conversation happen which is also super important i think it's also like a paradigm shift that has to happen you know with the war on drugs which is a war on people you know the fact that um we're criminalizing people for their uh, a symptom of their disease right you know if you want to look at it you know whether you 
you know, think of it as a disease or a choice. You look at it the same way you look at, um, say, diabetes, you know. Um, you know, you can develop diabetes from bad choices and bad lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. you Which you still get, that yeah. way, You know, and that's what happens with addiction. But yet, these people are being criminalized for, for that. And so, um, but that, you know, goes into deeper. We start looking at the war on drugs and we're looking, these aren't people, these are addicts. These are junkies, these are criminals. You know, we're not looking at, these are people, these are neighbors, brothers, sons, parents, you know? And so I think it's a paradigm shift in society. Law enforcement is just one of those institutions, you know, that, you know, that has got to change. Yeah. I think you bring up a really important point about media and when it can be used for good and when we can perpetuate a stereotype. So here we have a documentary that we want to get out far and wide to have, to have this type of discussion. But if we turn on law and order episode tonight, we'll hear <laughs> the word junkie somewhere in that out, you know, in that hour. So part of it, I think, is also incumbent on us to continue to try to change from the outside, you know, the forces that we don't necessarily, we don't have that necessarily opportunity to talk to NBC, right, today and tell them how to change their 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 film, you know, their TV. But at the same time, if we put out this type of media, we continue to put out on our social media channels, what we do, we start really changing the conversation. We start changing how we talk about things. So that, that's always been one of my biggest concerns is we have this fundamental shift in this country where we're talking about addiction more, we're talking about mental health more, we're, we're changing our language. We don't say committed suicide anymore for a good reason. You know, we, we've changed that to die by suicide. I've seen that change in the news yeah. and how they report it. Right. Yet we'll turn on a new uh, program tonight and we're still going to have that stigmatizing language. Mm -hmm. So as we talk about what are positive shifts we can make, the, the media is a big piece of it and, and we need to continue mm -hmm. to try to influence it. It was in the film, actually, uh, the, it was a news piece in the news, two anchor people talking and they were talking about um, addicts. Mm -hmm. You know, they use that was right. the that was the language that they used. You know, and it's perfect example. You know of um, how we stigmatize and you know and we're labeling people. Yeah, right. And, and to this to, to this day, every time I talk to reporters, I have to be very explicit about how I want my bottom third the, mm -hmm. to, to show up. Mm -hmm. I was doing a program for a prevention program that I was working with in DC and the kids had done a concert, a, a contest and they were there and I happened to do a poem while I was there, but it was about the kids and da da da. And, I was, and so, but the, 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 it went up and I was like, mom, you gotta look at it. You gotta look at it, da da da. Uh, former drug addict was my title. <laughs> right. um, right. Right. I'm like, yeah, boom, boom, drug out. I was like, oh, I mean, you're not lying, but I mean, right. I know what you were going for when you did that, and what it perpetuates in the society is the dehumanizing right. of individuals to the point where jail seems right. like we don't just just get you know, yeah, just we go over there. It. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry, absolutely. Yeah. I think I'm going to play the devil's advocate just for a minute. I think all of these things are really true. I'm already. What's the opposite it. side of this? Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, think, devil's I think when you're working with these things, it is so hard and so painful when you come to the space, whether you're a law enforcement or a teacher or a parent or a school counselor or a clinician, you come to the space to help and Sometimes when it feels like there's not enough help or there's not the help that we have available isn't getting there, I think it's a it, I think it's part of that response is sort of self-protection because at some point it's painful to sit in the space where you're like, how can I help? I mean, I was thinking of this when we were talking about you know law enforcement. Okay, it's painful to see people in their communities who need help. And then there's not enough help. What do you do? And you know, and I, I think we're starting to see that and hear it from professionals working in this field too. There's just not enough. There's not enough help. There's not enough mm -hmm. kinds of free services. You know, free. I mean, open, easy. You know, barriers removed kind of services. You're familiar with. You know, lots of barriers put in place um, to keep people from accessing things. I think it's just. 
a point I wanted to make. It yeah. doesn't make it okay, but it's, it's just a different way to think about it. Right? Yeah, and and what what I hear is, unfortunately, we're not raised to understand the full capacity of our power. Right. And so as a police officer, if I was feeling overwhelmed by the lack of resources in my community, there is nothing technically in the way of me becoming an advocate to bring more things into my community. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear that, I agree with you. But what I want them to hear is if all 400 of us roll down to the next um meeting at a uh, city council meeting mm -hmm. and said we the police officers of this town are tired of doing everything we need to have more support here more support there those people on the other side who are always saying support our police officers would be put into a situation where they would have to decide what was more important the bottom line or the human beings that these folks are now supporting and that's for clinicians and so i think there's 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 human services and then there's advocacy and i think that we could do a better job at bringing those folks together and that you know, talking about unionizing but even though i'm a union person but i'm saying bringing those folks together and um and showing them how powerful their voices are if every police officer told a story about a time where they went into a space and they didn't have the tools for what the yeah. job needed and they just said that one after the other at a you know it would because it, it, it's not me anymore I'm not there and they're risking their lives. I would love to hear them talk more about that. So I've got two points that, that pop up in my head. One is you, I think you're alluding to compassion fatigue and mm -hmm. some of the, what yeah. I hear. Mm -hmm. And I hear officers all the time say, I need to hear this good, good story. Yeah. I never hear the good stories. And I think that is across the board yeah. because you know they're there for 10, yeah. 15 minutes, they're, they're problem solving mode. And then maybe someone gets connected to Greg and Greg connects them to Lewis and they're going to Carolina treatment and everything mm -hmm. is going really well. Mm -hmm. The officers never know this. They never ever know. And even detention officers tell me, I just know if I don't see you come back into the jail, everything must be going fine. Yeah. But you know, they're really you can hear it in their voice. They say you really need to hear something. The other thing is talking about resources. Like I'll go back to C4. C4 here in, in Fayetteville is this diverse stakeholder. We get together every month. Unfortunately, it's still Zoom. But we're really talking about services that we have here in Cumberland or maybe some gaps and we're really trying mm -hmm. to address those. Right. But you know, that's a great venue for anyone who's feeling, whether it's you know, a clinician or law enforcement, et cetera, who's feeling like I don't know what the resources are. You know, and I think that speaks to the strength of community coalitions. Yeah. yeah. That there there is a group, find a group or yeah. create a group and bring everybody together so that you can support each other mm -hmm. and minimize that risk of compassion mm -hmm. fatigue. And I just want to when you said advocacy, you know, Greg's first film, mm -hmm. The Anonymous People, mm -hmm. was really a breakthrough out of, I'm so old, I remember that song, Dirty Laundry, right? In terms of the, the, the presentation by the media was always the disaster of the problem of addiction. And I, for me, seeing The Anonymous People, the first time I saw it, and his second movie <laughs> about Generation High. There are a lot of people, I talk to a lot of people in this town that don't know about recovery high schools mm -hmm. and that we now have two in North Carolina. And so I just, I agree that we need more out there. People don't know that I'm in recovery. It's not visible. <laughs> and and they don't know that I do have felony drug charges in my past unless I share that and so um and I'm very grateful that it has been a that that my recovery community has been so strong and I had such a such a wonderful opportunities of recovery community support for me to continue this path and do this process but we do need more verbalization and visualization about that recovery does work. <clears throat> Some people don't get the understanding. They don't really get the information that it does. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you were talking about resources earlier. And, you know, I think about a managed care organization. 
you know, they're providing crisis intervention training to those police officers where they're teaching them that mental health first aid, where they're teaching them to recognize when a person is in a crisis, whether they need jail or whether they need hospitalization or whether they need their mental health addressed. We, and, but it's selective. It's not something that's required. And I think that's something that needs to change. Our police officers need to be able to know how to identify, is this person in a crisis? Does it really need to be a police officer going out or does it need to be a mental health crisis clinician going out that it's called? You right. know, you talked earlier about, um, you know, wanting to call the police or being more apt to see police or see law enforcement as a resource. Mm -hmm. I think if that changes where we're calling them for the appropriate help. Yeah. You know, we're not calling them for you to come and send us to jail. We had a situation in the county that I came, that I come from, where we had an individual who was suicidal. He's in his car. He called for help because he was in a crisis. Mm -hmm. They came out and law enforcement mm -hmm. killed him because he had a gun. That's not what he needed. He needed mental health assistance. He needed crisis assistance. He needed somebody to come out and provide him the crisis management that he needed. He didn't need law enforcement to come out and see him as a threat and to take his life. Mm -hmm. So we need programs like that. We yeah. need that diversion of funding from law enforcement to go into law enforcement to teach them crisis, that emergency crisis that goes out for those calls. Yeah. And how does that happen? That advocacy, that somebody on that law enforcement that says, you know, I had a family member who had a mental health issue and I don't want somebody going out who sees them as a threat and says, shoots them rather than gives them the help that they need. Or even those officers, sorry, like even those officers, because I know they didn't want to do it, but there's so many things in between them, legally speaking, that would be, I don't know, wonky, not wonky. Uh, that they would not be able to go out and say that out loud because then that would be maybe admitting there was a mistake or that there was something culpable, even though we're not blaming them for what they felt they had to do in the moment because it followed their training. And so opening, trying to figure out a way to open it up so that they could have these conversations, honestly. Sorry, I know you were ready yeah. there. Can, can I just bring it real quick? I just want to go back to like, we've talked a lot about like what happens in that moment, but what about like the prevention side? Like way years and years before, like how do we even get to a scenario where I'm even having a conversation with law enforcement mm -hmm. uh, or, or any or a clinician for that matter? And Ricky mentioned resilience earlier. And I think that is a piece that is so missing. And it takes yeah. me back to, um, the part in the film where you're doing the classroom scenery yeah. and you're really appealing to mm -hmm. um, the youth and, and their their soul and their spirit. I mean, really their spirit, I think really spoke to me. So like, how do we get to that place? Mm -hmm. Like, how do we get more schools that are embracing of doing something different and really feeding mm -hmm. their souls? Yeah, we're doing a lot of, I, I guess you could say down, downstream conversation. This one leading a little more towards that, but it's, it's still vital because they're, we still have, we, we can't just go back upstream and focus there and forget about that. So I'm really I love what we've been talking about. But since you brought it up, um, I think that the idea is the term community needs to be re-examined, and I, I I feel like there are there are pockets of communities, um, different groups. You know, we have clicked up for in different political ways, different racial ways, different uh, class and financial ways, and what we do believe or don't believe, and so on and so forth. And so we have schools where our children are at, and we're doing our best not to to keep them as agnostic as possible because we don't want the dare challenge somebody's you know belief system or parenting. And so, if a teacher were to speak out and say, "No, we're going to handle this." through compassion, um, we're going to have a restorative justice circle in this space, there's the chance that one of the parents would say, that is not what I consider to be justice. We want this to be punitively handled. This kid is out of here because of that. Right. And so the conversation, and we, it brought, brought up in the last, the last call we had, is about how do we get all of those stakeholders into one space? and then let them listen to their children. And that's, and that's what I love to do is the, the, the gratitude poems that we wrote in that space in the movie. Um, at the end, I don't know if you caught this or not, but I challenged them to take that poem to somebody that they wrote it for. And I said, you need to tell them this. 
because your parents don't understand it per se because they're too busy or because they weren't trained in this to ask these types of questions. Because if we were to listen to what our young people want, they are conflicted in how we are changing from the things we taught them in K through third grade about how we live with one another and accept everybody and we forgive each other and we share all of our things by fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, that message starts to shift. Um, and it becomes, no, my kid needs to make it into college or my kid can't hang out with those kids on that side and da 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 da. And that's a message that that tears at the very fabric of our society, which again begins that process of othering. Right. Sorry, I know we're running out of time. <laughs> well, I do want, so I love the discussion about prevention, of course, because it really is true. You can you can have a piece of paper or or you can crinkle up a piece of paper and then try to make it flat again. Um, we have a lot of students that have crinkled up pieces of paper and they are going to have to carry a lot with them just from this moment in time. And so I'm a big advocate of prevention for sure. I think back to the conversation about community, what that looks like, I think it's real easy in the crisis mentality and the, we really need to do something, but we're not really sure what, there's not enough stuff. I think it's easy for us to sort of focus on one thing, like you should do more. You have legitimate power, do more. And I think that happens also with the schools a whole lot. It happens with parents. I feel like as a parent, like parents should be doing this. School should be doing that. Law enforcement should be doing that. I think the fact of the matter is we're all in this together right now. And we all have to figure out sort of a new way to do it as a community. So I like your how you, how you describe that. And with that, I really do want to hear from some of our community members out there hey, um, with, some members. Of their, with some of their questions. We wish you were here with us. <laughs> um, before we hop into questions, as we were talking about some of the law enforcement, we had a comment come in that I, I think would be helpful for us to kind of address and look at. It says, um, what you're missing is that fire and EMS are dispatched to all the incidents you're talking about. Fire and EMS are not equipped to respond without law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So just kind of adding that piece to the conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Melissa, I don't know if you specifically have like any, any other thoughts kind of on that, but. Yeah, especially if you're talking about like an overdose, there's always probably going to be a co or do dual dispatch, right? Is what you would have both of them and then EMS would be on scene. One of them would administer naloxone. But what's great about here in Cumberland is that they have community paramedicine and they're really taking an active approach to also be in that linkage to care, that connection. And so, um, yeah, I appreciate somebody bringing that up. That, that mm -hmm. is important. It's not always just law enforcement. It really can be any of our first responders that mm -hmm. have that opportunity to make that connection. And that is one of the new things, part of the process today was talk about the good things. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the new things that has come to come to Cumberland County is a really focused community paramedicine mm -hmm. about substance misuse and mental health. And mm -hmm. so I, for one, am very excited about um, the county hiring an experienced person who had done this in another county and really had great data results, positive mm -hmm. results that's now in Cumberland County. Mm -hmm. So one of the first questions says, I love the idea of the engagement center mentioned in the mm -hmm. film. What would it take for something like that to happen locally? Wow, what a great question. <laughs> Again, like for harm reduction, we kind of call it like a health hub, right? You come in and you can get harm reduction services, mm -hmm. but you can also get other connections to service, maybe like Carolina Treatment or Fayetteville okay. Treatment. Or, or Coastal Horizons has an office there. Mm -hmm. And so it's like what you would see for a justice center, right? Where you're going and getting mm -hmm. domestic uh, violence advocacy and other victim services. Um, I'm sure the answer is money. I am sure that the drive is here and the commitment's here, but mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you uh, think? There's been discussion, you know, within the harm reduction to get a fixed site here. I yeah. think it really does boil down to like funding, you know, mm -hmm. buy-in from the county. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's a, I'm, I'm working with a, a, a treatment center and I'm not going to name them because it's still um, in its infancy, but they are working with, in, in Philadelphia, working with UPenn and they have community health workers at this um, uh, college about where they study community health workers. And this treatment center is working with this organization to hire and train community health workers um, so that 
because we understand that when folks come into treatment centers, most of them, that's their only uh, connection to healthcare, right? And it could be their only connection to getting a job or getting something fixed on their record or something to get them back into the system where we can provide them with these health services. Um, and so it's a private business that's working with the city and this university. And so I think um, there has to be, because when we talk about where the money is, there has to be uh, a connection between some of the private, some of the nonprofit, some of the uh, government, and, and so that the money isn't just coming from the same pool of money. Because when we do that, we're just rearranging the money there and someone else is losing it. You know, there's another this happening for another topic somewhere else. And they're talking about getting money from the same pool of money we're talking about. Yep. So trying to find other ways to um, bring in the community, the for-profit community and nonprofit community yep. um, is I think super important towards making something like that happen. And I know that's mm -hmm. part of the partnerships that they have in Boston to make that happen. I like and the philanthropic community. Philanthropic community, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add on to that, that uh, an engagement center in Cumberland County would be awesome, sounds great. I think one thing that um, um, people don't do is utilize the resources that we do oh, yeah, have. Yeah. You know, we do have a lot of different resources here, everything from, you know, in as much to um, the Fayetteville Urban Ministry, the Man of Church. I mean, there are a lot of different resources um, that are in the community that people don't tap into. Um, maybe that's because, and we talked about, you know, in some of our coalition meetings about getting the information out in a way that makes it more visible so that people are aware that these things are here. But um, we do have a lot of resources that are here that are doing this, you know, not exactly what was happening in the game, yeah. center, but a lot of the same but, work. And, and I think that's where the community health worker comes in because they're the glue. Like you, not everyone in the, it needs to know about everything, but there needs to be somebody who knows about all the things. So if you can't get into one building, all of these servers represent a, a, a center a here, a network here. Um, and so, but who's the person that you go to that is aware of all of that? And so it's not even about advertising. How do you advertise to people nowadays? Um, I think it's just about finding out where people are in their pain, in their suffering, in their addiction, in their recovery, and, and, and deploying those people to that space to say, hey, did you know? Yeah, I think it, it goes back to a couple of things too. Back to the advocacy conversation we were talking about. So whoever asked that question, not only thank you, but you can help with it too. Yeah. Because by asking the question and talking in town about what you'd like to see mm -hmm. and going to those city council meetings, I think that's the first thing. The other thing is you know, mental health and addiction are having a moment right now in terms of funding. One we have not had in the history yeah. of our field. And there are dollars that are coming down federally. Mm -hmm. There are great increases that are happening right now in the federal block grant that we expect to see. Um, we expect to see for the first time a set aside for recovery mm -hmm. in the block grant that we've never seen. Right. There's American Rescue Plan Act funds. So there are all those pieces. And at the same time, right this moment, is the advocacy opportunity in this community. Yeah. So for whomever asked <laughs> and the rest of you, keep speaking up. Yeah, because if right you don't now. go to those meetings, the people who want, they're going to put that money somewhere. They will. And they would probably prefer not all of us show up. So maybe we should. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so we have, a, I, I think this is true, a way to follow back up with everyone that's registered. That's one of the reasons that you registered. So we will be following up with your legislators and with leaders and saying, folks that were at this event, these 175 of us expressed these things. Here are the things that, that they want to see. Here's what they want followed up on. Here are the things that raised up. That's why we're doing the survey. And so we will follow up with that. That's one of the reasons that we're, we're doing this right now, because you're right. It is a different moment in time um, for us as a field. So, yeah. There are a lot of questions, so we are okay, okay, definitely okay, probably okay. answer okay. some of them in email post um, okay. this discussion. But <laughs> the next question, uh, we've talked about the complexities of the field and of harm reduction, and Sarah, you specifically spoke about the media. Mm -hmm. So this question says, can someone speak on the complexity and fallout of the recent crack pipe commentary that has now overshadowed the great work of harm reduction in this current time? The media reports about the SAMHSA funding 
I think that's what they're referring to. The SAMHSA funding for harm reduction in the media in the last like 24 hours is like Biden's oh, getting X amount for crack right. pipes. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, Does anybody and perhaps, I guess, like what that the spin is the, the, the media spin that of crack pipes and what that could do for the image of harm reduction that is. I would, I, 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 I'll but, jump on that. You know? Bit. You know, right? so, <laughs> here's the thing, right? So there, there's a, a lot of ways to come at that question. And, and, you know, we're right back to stigma again. We're talking about crack pipes, right? So we're right back to stigma. We're stigmatizing crack users, all right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, well, I'm going to leave that there. And I'm going to come back around to harm reduction and talk about um, how we look at the continuum of use. Mm -hmm. So if someone is... Um, injecting drugs. That's one of the highest risky behaviors that they could be engaging in. Mm -hmm. If there's a way to reduce that to smoking or snorting, mm -hmm. it might not look like success to some people, but from a harm reduction standpoint, that's success. We've moved someone from a more risky behavior to a less risky behavior. And sometimes that means going from one drug to another drug or from one extreme usage of a drug to a lesser one. And, you know, yeah, maybe the uh, we would hope that the ultimate goal would be abstinence or recovery. But when you're in like the most uh, active part of your addiction, abstinence seems a very far, 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 far away place that is almost impossible to get to. But when you can move someone on this continuum and these little incremental steps along the way, these are, these are changes that are happening within the stages of change. They're really small ones that for some people they can't see but they're real and as you move someone on that continuum then all of a sudden abstinence doesn't look so far away or mat doesn't look so far away treatment doesn't look so far away when they were injecting it looked impossible but now it looks possible so you know um, pipes and those sorts of things um, without the stigma attached to them you know there's another way of framing it to look at how it could be a good thing um, but you know, immediately we go to just the drama, you know, dramatizing. It's, it's, yeah. You know, it's a crack pipe. Look, they're, they're promoting smoking crack. No, yeah. they're not. And I would like to quickly jump in and say that one new thing that we also have here in Cumberland County is two very vibrant smart meetings. One of which will be held here tonight Seven at o six o'clock. Six. No, six o'clock. Six o'clock <laughs> at this location and. This man right here was very much a part of, um, there's one on Saturday morning at LifeNet um, services, and then one here tonight. And this community did not have multiple pathway items in this area until we begin. We did a needs, as part of the coalition, did a needs assessment and prevention, working together in all sorts of ways with, with, with people. And so I would really wanna thank Greg for his role in helping to be a smart facility facilitator and get two meetings going. And I understand that there's a third one starting out on base, which we're also very happy to have that location on Fort Bragg. Um, and so um, that it's and so I just I do understand and, and what I caught in the news the last 24 hours was that young people in recovery just got $3 million uh, a donation from a philanthropist. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was really hoping that we would end up with also a young people in recovery and yeah. possibility yeah. in this area mm -hmm. and all kinds of, so there's, the bottom line is just pay, you know, let's see if we can, let's see if we can find that pony uh, in the pile. <laughs> Um, do we have street outreach programs or units in North Carolina? We definitely got straight out street outreach happening in Cumberland County. Um, there's two outreach workers that work in Cumberland County that are out every day of the week doing everything from syringe exchange services, distribution of uh, naloxone, doing harm reduction education for overdose pre um, prevention um, and reversal, doing post overdose response work, um, HIV and hep C um, field testing, um, providing peer support, Lancaster care, all that stuff's happening in Cumberland County. Uh, I know North Carolina Harm Reduction also has um, um, outreach workers in Robinson County and, and Wake County and Durham and, and Wilmington and Haywood, and so, um, and there's other organizations that are in the state that are doing harm reduction as well. Got outreach going on. So. Awesome. With the current climate being more open to harm reduction, how can we move these resources forward more quickly? Specifically, increasing the use of harm reduction courts for those incarcerated instead of being recommended straight to treatment. 
education, I think educating the community about what harm reduction is. I think when you go back to that stigma piece, I think up until maybe this point, it feels like people only associate harm reduction with people who use drugs, but we all practice harm reduction every day. We wear seatbelt, we wear sunscreen, et cetera, but nobody really talks about, oh, I'm practicing harm reduction, I'm wearing my seatbelt. So we really have to, I think, uh, get people to understand what harm reduction is so they can promote it in their own community and, and introduce it in conversations. Um, and then the other part of that question is just taking that knowledge to the court system, the judicial system as a whole, and getting them to understand how it's individuals who are suffering with a substance use disorder are going to greatly benefit from community-based behavioral health services versus the criminal justice system. Right. The criminal justice system was never intended to be therapeutic, never has been, never will be, and but we keep trying to push people that way because that's what the law says you should do, and it's not good, okay? So that comes with uh, increased education. education and training of officers to say, here's your resources. You can use your discretion and do X, Y, Z by policy or protocol, um, but just getting those agencies to implement those strategies. When you talk about the courts, I was just going to mention, I think, Joseph, you had said that there's a lot of fatigue from law enforcement not hearing the positive stories. Yeah. But the family courts, mental health court, drug court, those positive stories filter up in those courts. So when you were talking about the question about courts, it made me think, how do we connect those more so those law enforcement officers who are looking and want to hear those stories, mm -hmm. and then we create new advocates in those law enforcement officers. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I was, yes, yes, yes. Um, dude, I love the way you described harm reduction. Um, harm, blah, blah, blah. Um, harm reduction, and I've never heard it explained so succinctly. Um, and like I like I know the definition of it. I, I I'm a believer of it. However, that I grew a stronger connection by hearing you say what you just said. And I don't think, to your point, there's I say 90% of this community couldn't give you a definition of what harm reduction was, or even what field we're talking about when we talk the word when we say the phrase harm reduction. And so that comes to um, there has to be a concerted effort amongst the advocates in this space to get the story out there, to cultivate the stories of the people who live in this community, who have the lived experience, whether it be from uh, living through addiction or having your life saved by harm reduction or being someone who has seen lives saved by harm reduction, the more spaces we create for that to be said out loud, the more people understand what's going on, the easier it is to um, call BS when we have questions like the, the not the question about the crack right, but the fact that people are trying to manipulate this and turn it into a, a particular direction, how much is a life worth? And then you know that every single one of these steps is worth it if we're talking about a life that you love, yes. right? And so I, 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 that has to be like at the top of the game because if the the moral argument is not going to win on its own. If people don't know what it is you're talking about, yes, of course, obviously everyone in this room believes in it, but if we're not getting those stories out there, if we're not having workshops where we're getting people to come together to learn how to talk to the press or talk to their city council folks, if we're not getting them, then it's just the same people screaming into the wind after a while. Well, the data, the data supports it as well. Yeah, you know, um, okay. we, we capture that data, and you know, we I had I think around three hundred and eighty some odd overdose reversals mm -hmm. last year in Cumberland County alone. That's a result of our not in the program that goes right along with the syringe exchange yeah. program. So if that program wasn't in place, you know, then that's three hundred and eighty lives that may not have been saved last year. And one of those lives with every member of their family that loves them, walking into a room, yeah. showing the effect, will is is as powerful as knowing that number, if not more powerful. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, yeah. anyone can advocate. Yeah. It's not just the person with lived substance mm -hmm. misuse. Yeah. It is any, like in the movie, yeah. right? That friend, that woman yeah. who yeah. then yeah. became, she, yeah. was, she just was a friend. Of this person, you don't have to. We're all touched by it. it's a yeah. community, so no one goes untouched, yeah. right? So the other thing I'll say about that, and yes to everything, I agree with you all. You kicked off something with this question, but I have to add that it's that same kind of thinking that got us exactly to where we're at right now. 
that. Oh, it's a sensationalizing, dramatizing. You say stigmatizing. I say, you know, I might use different language for that. Mm-hmm. Sensationalizing, you know, I think that is the kind of thinking that got us to the place we're at right now. And so if there's one thing that I hope we all walk away from after we get through this moment in time and on to the next pathway that we're all focused on is that if we're not focusing on removing barriers of all sorts, and that is our primary focus, so prevention, treatment, recovery, whatever kind of pain people are in or whatever supports they need, if that is not our singular focus right now, removing any barrier, stigma is a barrier to reaching out and getting access, we are all missing the boat. And it's that kind of thinking that underpins us not removing those barriers. And we can't afford to do that right now. Um, and I think maybe one more question. We're getting close. <laughs> yes, we might be able to sneak in too because that's a great book one. But um, Joseph, yeah, this is kind of like a twofer for you. Um, one, can you speak to how your work has grown since the film? Mm-hmm. And in doing that, can you tell us how you and your work have been received as you've expanded your work into working with prisons? Uh, um, so since the movie has come out, they, it's funny because they because COVID hit three months after they wrapped filming. And so that changed our work more than any movie coming out could have. So there was two years from when we wrapped to when the movie actually came out. Um, and so they actually sent a film crew out six months or so before the actual cut came out to see where everybody was and how their lives had been affected. Because when the movie cut, um, Marty was, well, Marty was not the, uh, the, the secretary of, 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 of labor. And so they were able to, to show that progression. And for me personally, I went digital with all of the work that I had been doing um, and, and doing things like this, live streaming, recording workshops, um, we had gotten a grant, uh, the movie Just Mercy had just come out and we gotten a grant from the folks who made that movie to do workshops and uh, create a series of workshops based around the work of a poet who was uh, formerly incarcerated and we were going to just go into the prison with him, but then we couldn't do that. So we filmed it um, and we, we they we we they got to watch it and then we had a Zoom session with them, the, the inmates as they were writing and responding to it. Um, because they, those prisons were, as you know, like nursing homes and places of that sort were hit harder than, than, than most places. Um, and so right now what I'm noticing with the, the, cause the film is just starting to come out. I'm just, I'm noticing that people, and this was said to me when I walked in here today was like, I, if every classroom had what I was doing in that space, not done by me, um, but done by whomever, uh, how much more compassionate and resilient our young people could come out as. And so I'm hoping that that trend continues and people will start seeing that we can't just do math and science. We have to talk about why we're doing math and why we're doing science and what this means for our society and what do you, um, what makes you excited about being here? And what, what type of world do you want to build young person or, you know, we're going to keep getting more of this. And I'll stop there because we don't have a whole lot of time. But you can always hit me up if you want to know more. <laughs> Sarah Howell, yeah. how far away are we from receiving that 10% set aside? And what can <laughs> 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 <Yo>. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what Yo. Great can, question. What can we as a community do to help move this forward? Love the question. Um, we are on a continuing resolution until March 11th. We are hopefully, yes, it's a long yeah, continuing resolution. To get their act again. We are hearing very positive reports that we think that we will get there um, in a larger federal budget. It's not really about the set aside, it's, set aside is not what holding up Congress. What's holding up Congress is everything that holds up Congress, right? So we are hearing that we believe after March 11th, we actually will get that federal budget. And there is a lot of positive indications that the set aside is very much supported. However, in North Carolina, your senators are very important to this process. I believe you have somebody within the um, appropriations for labor HHS. So what I would suggest is if you do not know how to contact your United States senators, 
please Google that and reach out to them and tell them you support the set aside and that you would like to make sure that is in the budget that they will be debating in the next month. Um, and also find your congressional delegate. And if you're not sure how, the team at APNC can absolutely help you out. So we will make sure to get that done. I, I thank you for that question because everybody on there mm -hmm. in the next day should be reaching out to their congressional reps and the two U.S. senators and tell them you support that set aside. Yep. Takes two minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> two minutes yes. to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Speaking of two minutes, I think we're, we're wrapping up. So um, quick final comments from anyone before we wrap. I, I just want to say thank you to all of you. I think we could all sit here until midnight talking and talking and talking. And that's exactly why we asked you to be here. You have so much to share. Thank you for everything that you do in the field as humans um, and, and in your community. So I, I really thank you for sharing the space with us um, and for letting us know more about what's working here and, and how you plug in. So any other final thoughts? Yeah. I would, you, you should go first. last because you are going to say something much more profound um, than I am. <laughs> you started us. Um, I'm just going to say, put in a plug, in terms of this movie and us talking about media, tonight, Darren Waller is up for Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. Oh. We will find out tonight if he gets it for his work in recovery. So if he does, keep an eye out and promote that on social media and promote the conversation and changing that because that's how we continue to do that. So I'm excited to see um, if he's able to achieve that for the exact work that we're talking about. And then we talk about what we do in our community similar to what he does. You know, and I just want to piggyback on that. That moment in the film when the guy in the stands gave him the coin, coin. God, yes. that was yeah. so touching because yeah. you could feel the compassion between two people that he took enough time and he was really excited to do this. And people who are in recovery should not be in the dark. They right. should be embraced, right? Yeah. And you should, we should all be embracing each other. And I, that moment was really resonated with. And what you just said is something that everybody listening on this call can do. They could promote, you know, the positive news mm -hmm. if that happens right. for him. Yes. Um, anybody else? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I was told I have to go last. Go ahead. I'm just going to go. Yeah. Um, and if someone is inspired by this, that's cool. Um, I, it, it's, it's, it's echoing what is being said, and it was, it was what is in my mind, and I think that's really, the, the question about the, the crack pipes has just been sticking with me, because um, we have more power to cultivate uh, the environment around us than we give ourselves credit for. Mm -hmm. And so our response to that article, or whatever you saw about that, is realizing that you have social media also. Mm -hmm. Right. And you get to choose what you post to the wall of your social media, which is what your friends get to see. You don't have, if someone does something negative, you don't have to jump in their comments. It doesn't have to be about an argument. Post the opposing article, post love, post uh, recovery, post redemption, post kindness, just cuz. Right. Because the more of that we get out there the less it seems like the crack pipe situation is really what's, you know, what we should be scared of. If someone uses something to invoke a negative emotion from you, that is a form of manipulation. And you have to ask, why are they doing that, right? And in and, and a bill that is meant to save millions of lives, that's what that person, whoever that media outlet or that reporter wants to focus on, you have to say, do I want to be a part of that or do I want to combat it? So see it and then post something positive, post a nice story, just tell people that you love them and that it's gonna be okay because somebody needs to hear that. Um, and that's my comment for today. And thank you all for joining us. Um, we are continuing to do these around the state. Check APNC's website for more information on, on follow-up sessions. We will circle back to the questions we didn't get to. We're so sorry we couldn't get work those in, but we'll send those out in uh, the FAQ documents. Please fill out your surveys. This is how we are communicating on the behalf of this area when we're talking in the, the policy arena and with your leaders. So please share uh, so that we can represent you best. 
And thank you for joining. Have a great night, everyone.